All right, good afternoon, everyone. So a couple of you have, can I, hello, hello, hello. A couple of you have sent some questions on Piazza, and I'm going to do those in just a minute. But I did want to take a few minutes to have a look at one of the homework assignments from last week and to make it clear what it is that I had hoped uh, in terms of how that would be solved. So if we look at <coughs> the baby names one, which one was the baby names? It was B or C? It was B, right? Um, ah. Let's see. Um, yes, all right. So, so there is a, a worked example that you know, had this amusing application with these baby names. And there were reports that showed like the boys and the girls. And now we're supposed to report all the ones that are present in one but not the other. And the wording is all confusing. It's easier to see it when we see an example. So the way to see an example is to get this code to compile. Um, all right, and now we're seeing of course, there was no actual output because I didn't put in anything. But now we're seeing some expected output. Um, and we'll see the input in a minute. And all right, so here are some provided files. And so now if one wants to, to process these by hand, then we're supposed to read out all of the boys' names. So all of these here. We're supposed to be reading out all of the girls' names. And that by itself doesn't seem to be impossible, right? Because um, the second one is the boys, and the fourth one is the girl's name in each row, and so on. So, and then what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to print. Let's see, here we have a column with boys' names. And here we have a column with girls' names. And over here we have another column with boys' names and another column with girls' names. So let's see what it says. It says the names present in the first file and then the names present in the second file. So I still don't get it. So does that mean that all of these here are, the, are from the first file? Is that what it means? Yes? And so these are the boys in the first file, not in the second. So I would put, for example, Dakota in here. If in, in the first file, Dakota was a boy, and in the second file, he wasn't a boy. And over here, I would put in Cassidy if Cassidy was a girl in the first file, but not a girl in the second file. So the first question you always want to an answer is, could I do it by hand? So if I had to do it by hand, what would I now do? I would look at Michael. Michael's in the first file. And I would wonder, should I or should I not include Michael in the first column? And well, let's see, what about the 1990s? Well, Michael is again there. So in this case, I would not include Michael and I. So knowing it to do it by hand means that you could, you know, given a boring 15 minutes, completely reproduce the output by hand. And is there anyone still who feels that they couldn't do that? And then I'll go through that. In but it looks like everyone kind of has figured this out. So, so that's the first step. And it usually takes me about 10, 15 minutes or so to do that, because there's always these ambiguities. Like someone uh, 
was complaining about that on Piazza and said, these descriptions, they're never clear. You know, what does he mean with saying first column, a second column, a first batch, or a second batch? And that's always kind of going to be the case. There's only so much wording that I can use that, you know, to me, it seemed clear. But um, in that case, oftentimes one can answer the question by just looking at the example. And that's, of course, something one should do. Sometimes one can only ask, answer that question by putting a question on Piazza. If you don't exactly know what it is that you're supposed to do, you're completely hosed, right? You cannot progress. So you really want to find that out. And so I've gotten a couple of questions today about homework 5B that I'm going to answer in a few minutes. Because if you don't know the answer, there's just no hope to progress. If you don't know how to do it by hand, you know, forget about coding, forget about writing the pseudocode, you can't do it. So let's move on to how one would write pseudocode for this. So what, what, what I want to do is I want to read boys and girls from the first file to, and let me call the lists B1 and G1. So each of these are lists. And then I do the same thing for the second file. Read boys and girls from the second file to, and then I'll call them B2 and G2. And how do I exactly know how to do that? When you write the pseudocode, you should kind of get a, have a feeling for which of these things are most likely suitable for helper methods. And this kind of you know, reading input and putting it into some lists, that seems like a good thing to, for a helper method. So you might as well just, just write it up like that. Sometimes I might say, like in an exam, I might say, give me the pseudocode without any helper methods. But that's, that's kind of rare. So in this case, you know, we'll, we'll just write it down like you would explain it. And then later we'll drill down and say, how do you actually do this? Now, what do I need to do? Now I need to find all of the ones that are boys in the first, but not the second. So I'll say let B3 be the names in B1, but not in B2. And in a level of 46B, it should be clear that these are two lists. This is some list manipulation thing. You look at all of the ones in the first one that are not in the second one. We'll be able to drill down in this and implement it uh, soon enough. Let B4 be the names in B2, but not in B1. And similarly, let G3, G4 be the same with the girls. And now I need to print in columns B3 and G3 and print in columns B4 and G4. Does that sound like a reasonable summary of the task? So that's exactly what, if, if you look at what it says in the problem description, you know, it pretty much tells, tells you all the same thing. But here, I've done it at a, at a more detailed level of detail. Now, you might say, but, but, but how do you do any one of these things? So now we can look for some helper methods. And so clearly, this thing here, would lend itself to a helper method, right? Because we're doing the same thing twice. And so we'll make that into a method. The printing thing
that seems to lend itself to a helper method. We have a list of names, we have another list of names, and we're supposed to put them next to each other. And there's names in one list but not the other. That seems to be four times the same helper method. So now it looks like my job is to produce three different helper methods. Which one of them is the easiest? Is it easier to read the boys and girls from a file? Or is it easier to find everything in one list but not the other? Or is it easier to print two lists in parallel? Okay, here we have a vote for two lists in parallel. Um, so at this point here, you now open a new sheet of paper. Um, Now, uh, I can give these lists any way I want. So the rule of the game is if you want to make like a helper method, you underline it like that. That way it kind of looks like the top of an index card. And now we're going to see how do we print A and B in parallel. Can we do it by hand? So you have a list. You have another list, maybe longer, maybe shorter. And now what do you do? Well, it looks like you need to print this one, then this one, then this one. These are all pretty straightforward. And at some point, something funny is going to be happening here when one of the lists runs out of names. So if one does this by hand, where one of them runs out of names, then there's any number of ways one can do it. but to me, a simple way, of, uh, a simple thing to do is to say, well, I'll just print a blank name using the same formatting that I already had. You already have the formatting in place with a percent %s to print them left and right. So if you print a blank name, then that'll surely work. So that's the strategy that I now have in mind, is I say, I'm going to go to the index that's the larger of the two, and at each step, I'm either going to print the first, uh, the first uh, element or I'm going to print a blank name. And the same thing for the second one. I'm either going to print it or I'm going to print a blank name. Um, so then the pseudocode would look like this. So max of A size and B size is the longer of the two. So if i is less than a size, I, I get that element. Otherwise, I let left, left them be blank. I do the same thing for right. See, the beauty with pseudocode is if it's totally obvious, you can write same for right. You don't have to say, it's not programming, right? You don't have to say if i is less than b dot size, right is b dot get i else, right is blank. So, and now you print the left and the right, and each of them at 30 spaces. That way you either print the name or you print the blank and it'll all come out nicely aligned. And when you look at it, it's going to be guaranteed to work, right? There's nothing really at this level that can go wrong. Let's look at the one with removing all the elements from one that are in the other.
So now I have to drill down into this procedure. Um, now there's a decision to be made. Should I remove the elements from A or should I return a new list with the result? So I'm supposed to find everything that's in one list but not in the other. And I have really these two ways of doing it. I could physically remove all of the ones that I don't want and make A a shorter list in the process. Or should I leave A and B unchanged and return a new list? And so this is something where some, you know, basic programming comes in really handy. Like somewhere in chapter 8, they told you, don't ever modify anything unless you have to. It's always better to compute new than it is to, recom to, to, to mutate something existing. And so there was some notion of saying it's best to avoid what's called side effects. The side effect is if a function is given something and that something is then changed. So the idea is it's always best for a function to return something new than it, and it's not so good to modify something that's, that's been handed to it. Um, <coughs> so, and that's the approach we're going to be taking. So we're going to say R is an empty list. For each element in A, if it is not in B, add it to, to R. And then we return it. That's how you compute the difference between two lists. And when you look at the pseudocode, it, I think it's hard to argue with, right? This is going to work. You know how to get through all of the elements in an array. You've done it, you know, hopefully, 100 times. And there's, there's two loops that you can decide. You can decide to use the for each loop or the regular loop. Either one of them will work. You get each element. How do you find out whether an element is contained in another list? Is there a method for it? There actually is a method for it. There's a contains method that you can use. That is a perfectly good question, by the way, that you can ask on Piazza. You could ask, is there a standard method to do this? Is there a standard method to test whether an element is contained in a list? And someone is going to say, well, yeah, of course, there's contains. And then you're free to use it. You're always free to use any library function that you can find. So the hardest part is the third one. We're supposed to be reading the boys and girls. And it's actually not that hard, right? I mean, you would say for each line. You would split what by white space? Does that look right? I might have been off by the indexes. Let's double check the indexes. Um, yeah, I was wrong. So it's the index, it's one and three, and not two and four. But here's your pseudocode. So here the pseudocode is not all that hard. 
but we'll run into an issue with the implementation in just a minute. Okay, so that was the pseudocode in 12 minutes. If the pseudocode that you wrote for this problem does not look like this, dig out your pseudocode and ask yourself, how could you, what could you have done differently to make it look more like this? Because really, look at you know, where, where we're at. We're, we started at a high level description that really looks just like the problem description with a tiny b amount of extra detail, mostly you know, a a around here. We then broke down each of these separate uh, st steps into something that really is quite simple. And each of these ones, there's, there's really nothing there. And so at this point, all fear should be gone. There's nothing in this assignment that looks like rocket science. It's three helper met methods and then calling them in the right sequence. Um, <coughs> of course, not, not all is happy. There are a couple of implementation issues. So, uh, are we ready to, to do coding at this point? I always say don't, don't rush to code. Are we ready to code? Yeah, we're ready to code. So at this point, we understand enough about the problem that you know, it's productive to go into Eclipse. Oops. Ah. So, new project. This was homework for C. Oh, I don't want the source folder. That's something I don't want. Oh, I don't want the package. Okay, so let me code up one of these helper methods. And so let's do all elements in A, not in B. Give me a better name for this than all elements in A, but not in B. See, this is a helpful way you have a little uh, bit of uh, discrete math. In discrete math, if you have a set and another set, and then you want to look at all of the elements in, in, in the set A that are not in B, what do you call that? No, it's called the difference of the sets. So one would actually say the difference. So I'm going to just call the method difference. So what does it take? It takes an array list, um, which I need to import. Um, And it returns an array list. All right, so array list of string result. Okay, so, and we return it. Now Eclipse is happy. And now what was our plan? It was for string element in A, if not B contains element result. No, yeah, 
add element. That's it, right? Exactly the same as the pseudocode, except that the decisions like at the looping now has an explicit looping con construct, and for we have an explicit method call and so. On. How about this one here? The easy way of doing this one, and it's not super clean, is like this. Um, what, what should I call it? Read boys, girls. So it takes a file name. It takes an array list. Boys. An array list. Girls. Scanner is, not a file is. Yes. While in has next line. What did I call this thing? Oh, S, okay. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, Eclipse complains about an exception. Um, and we'll add a throws declaration. Okay, and it complains that we did that we didn't close this thing, so we put a try block. So that's it. Yes? Is it better to have the array list in the parameter versus just like having it return an array list an array list? Ah, very good. So, so what I was doing here is I am populating the array lists that are given to me. And I must admit, I don't really like it. Because the general rule is you should not modify any parameter variable. That's what's, that was what we, would be a side effect. In fact, just a few minutes ago, I said for computing the difference, it's best not to empty out a part of the first parameter. It's better to compute the answer. And so the answer is totally you, you, that you're right. It would be better in this case to figure out some way on how to return two lists. And what I was hoping to see in Piazza is lots and lots of questions about how the heck do I return two lists? That would have made me a happy person because that would have meant that people would have done this basic subdivision into three tasks, into you know reading the boys and girls, computing the differences, printing them in tabular form, and then in the first part with the reading the boys and girls, there is this obvious problem. How do you return the boys and the girls? And it's easy enough to, and I'm sure quite a few of you did that. Quite a few of you said, well, this, this is not worth my time. I'm just going to read the boys. Then I'm going to open the file again and read the girls. You know, that's, uh, you know, it's, you're not going to lose any points for it. It's not optimal, but uh, it's easy enough. That way you can return an array list. And here the trouble was, how do you return two array lists? And at first I said, oh, you know, I'll just return an array of two of them. And that turns out not to work for technical reasons. And then you have to return that array list of array list. And you'll see the solution that, uh, that I handed out. Um, so have a look at that, and you'll see you know, how one 
uh, can deal with that technical issue. Uh, it's not so pretty, and so it, now it's a judgment call. The language doesn't give me a great way of returning two things. You know, other languages do. Um, and where do you want to have the ugliness? Do you want to have the ugliness in that really overly complex return uh, type, or do you want to have the ugliness in having two, uh, two editable, uh, two, mo two mutated parameters? Um, whichever, or do you want to have the ugliness of reading the file twice? Any of those are perfectly fine decisions, and I would certainly encourage you to Piazza to discuss the merits of those various decisions you know, at that level of detail and say, what should I do? Should I have two parameters that I fill up? Should I read the file twice? Should I come up with a new helper class? Or, you know, there's any number of interesting ways of solving that. And that's really, those are things that, that are, world, uh, that, that are uh, worth talking about, you know, amongst yourselves or on, on, on Piazza. Those are good questions. You have a question back there. Oh, who cares? And it's not really my concern to be often. No. I have two other to totally. I, I'm with you all the way. Make your 12 array lists right. and do not worry about optimization. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to, to hassle anyone who read through the file twice. I'm just saying as a general thing, one tries not to do it. And I, what, what I'm trying to point out here is that there is no super wonderful solution in this. You're going to have to do something that's a little less than wonderful one way or another. That's all. But do not, by all means, in all of these homework problems, until I say it has to be this fast or something, don't worry about it. I will tell you if there's some situation where you need to do something a fast way. Later towards the course, we will run into that. We will start talking about performance and which ways can be done fast and which ways can be done slow. And what I'm then going to do with code check, actually, I'm going to make it so that if you do it the slow way, it'll time out on you. You'll notice. But right now, this assignment, total agreement, fast was not a question. Well, there was so we're never allowed to change the arguments in these project problems, right? This is for like Homer 4B, but what to do with the last big effort. So that checks for the syntax errors, and that would pass like a really ah. Yes, so, so here's the thing. So I do, at some, and sometimes I do try to drive behavior, and then I, in fact, make it so that you can't do it another way. So I very clearly, with that, with uh, that Aiken reader, I wanted to test, can you do exception throws? And I wanted to make sure that you throw those exceptions, and I made it so that if you didn't do it just so, it would fail. Okay. And, um, but in, in this other thing, I kind of said, you know, here's a helper method, but you could erase it and do it any other way. So if you can erase the method, then it's a suggestion. If it's in a file that you can't touch, then it is how I want it. So that's, that's really how you can easily tell which way. And you can always ask on Piazza and say, is it OK to change it? And uh, you'll get the answer. And if you get the wrong answer from someone, I will be all over and say, um, no, no, that's not what I meant. And you know, I might even go back and edit the test cases. So um, I could finish this another five minutes, but uh, you have a solution, so there's no point to it. What I really want you to understand is this is what I have in mind when I say, you know, write the pseudocode. You need to, to, to be able to write pseudocode, you have to know a bit of programming. Because otherwise, you wouldn't know what to choose. If you don't know that it's pretty easy to compute all of the elements of, that are in one list but not the other. It wouldn't occur to you to say, that's how I'm going to subdivide the problem. If you didn't know that it's pretty easy to read a file a line at a time to split the inputs and pick out the right elements and put them somewhere, it wouldn't occur to you that to say, that's what I'm going to make one of this, the helper methods. But that, I think, from someone who has taken 46A, that kind of intuition is reasonable to assume. And you need to put it to use. You need to be comfortable saying, this is a way of subdividing the problem kind of in, invent your subdivision, write it down, and then keep on going from there. 
So when I look at, you know, people say, I've been spending 14 hours on this. And if you follow it this way, there's no way it takes 14 hours, right? Because there is a logical progression from understanding the problem, writing the pseudocode, and then implementing, you know, really the not very complicated bits and pieces of the pseudocode. The trouble is, of course, if you don't do it like that, and if you just say, well, gosh, I have no idea, I'm just going to you know, write down some random pseudocode or start coding or something, then it really is very difficult, and I can see that it takes a long time. And so then you need to force yourself to step back and say, this is not working. And it is not working. If you spend 14 hours on something like that, it is not working. And um, it, so really, then, to go back to pencil and paper, really does seem to be a pretty good idea. All right, on to the questions about the homework. Um, where's Piazza? Oh yeah, it's coming back to me. So there was one question of someone who said, I have no idea what the heck you, uh, you mean for me to do in 5B. And that's a really good question. And we want to make sure that we get to the end of it. All right, so, so here's this problem 5B. And so it talks about we have a string. And now we want to somehow break down this string into smaller pieces. And each time we have two choices. We could either chop it off here, or we could chop it off here. Let me These are my two choices. And there's a cost involved to it. The cost of chopping it off, when it happens to be that what you chop off is a vowel, it's free. That great American word, right? It's free. So this one here cost us zero dollars. When you chop off a consonant, What's the cost? Now, just of this one decision, just in this step, what's the cost? It's four. It's the, OK. Now, why? This is, of course, completely and utterly artificial, right? This is something that sprang from my fertile imagination. Why do I make a problem that says, you demolish a string by breaking off vowels or consonants. Why do I do that? Because it's Google proof. Try Googling for this assignment. Try demolish strings. We can try it, right? Okay, so, so there is no way that, that, but if I gave you an assignment that says you know, implement Fibonacci or something, that would not be Google proof, right? Or if I gave you an assignment that says compute all permutations or some such thing. So, and you wouldn't learn anything from looking at some other clever code on how to do that. So I'm purposefully making this thing so that it, it looks a little bizarre and that you can't find it with Google. If I hadn't called it demolishing strings, I would have called it the Bulgarian string problem. <laughs> Try Googling for it. <laughs> okay? So, um, so that's just there so that you know, it's, it's, it's some old way that you need to do this. The point of this, though, is that um, in many optimization problems that you find in real life, you're in this situation where you make a decision and you incur some cost of that decision. 
and then you need to make another decision and another decision, but you don't right, quite know which, in which order you minimize the cost, in which order it is the cheapest way to go from A to B. And this happens everywhere. Like a robotic car that needs to find a path from A to B might need to make decisions and might, they want to conserve gas and they you know, do this or that sequence of accelerations and brakings and whatever. And it's not that you can say, oh, I'm going to take the cheapest thing at step A and then the cheapest thing at step uh, A plus one and so on. You sometimes have to find the combination of decisions that gives you the best result. And so that's what we're simulating here. All of that stuff with the strings and uh, that's just to make, to not have, to not burden you with a lot of domain knowledge. There was one person who said, oh, you know, I've been programming for Yahoo for years and at Yahoo we never have these kinds of problems. Well, of course you do actually. I just talked to a friend of mine who has a very complex optimization problem right now where he needs to spill, speed up a build that involves preloading tens of thousands of virtual machines in some order. And he needs to find the optimal sequence of steps. And what he's doing is something that's very similar to this algorithm. And <coughs> so, um, so yeah, no one cares about this specific instance, but the method is super useful. So, all right, so we now know we could make this decision to break in front or to break in the back, and we know what the cost is. So let's, um, now we need to make a decision though, which of them is better? And this is where the genius of recursion comes in. We're now going to ask recursively, what is the total cost? What is the best deal I can get on Mber? And I'm going to say, and what's the best deal I can get on Ambi? And if this one is cost one, and if that is cost two, then the total cost here is C1 plus zero. The total cost here is C2 plus 4. So which of the two will I choose? I have no idea which one I'll choose, but I'll choose the cheaper one. I'll just choose the cheaper of these two. And that's my total cost. Now, how do I know the demolition cost of Mber? Through the miracle of recursion. I'm writing a function that computes the cost of any string, and I can assume that it can compute the cost of smaller strings. So now that we understand what the problem is. Let's see, what did we just do? We computed the, what, what was the name of that function, that helper function that I gave you? The step cost or something? So this was the step cost of what the f how did the step cost what does the step cost get the first letter a letter and a string help me out here I don't remember a letter and a string What do you call everything but the last one? I, I don't know either. All but the last. <coughs> so if you look at here, I've simply formalized with a bit of pseudocode the same computation that I've done here. The green ones here are these step costs. Let me make them in green.
right this one was the dollar zero and the dollar four and these ones here were the recursive calls and what do I return Well, let's see what does it say over here. Here it says choose cheaper. So what do I return? How do I find the cheaper of these? Is there a function called cheaper? Yeah, just min, right? Or mass.min if you like. The math dot is just an implementation detail, so I just write min. Yes. Um, so for this one, uh, do we have to like deconstruct it to different times and return a cheaper way, or can we just have an algorithm that can go through it one time and return a cheaper way? Uh, you can try it another way. I don't think you'll, you'll succeed because. Um, yeah, um, see, this is one of those th uh, things. Another reason why I gave this problem is that um, we talked about last time that many recursions can be written as a loop. And this one is not so easily written as a loop because each time you branch out twice. Let me actually put that on another page because that's a good visual. Um, so... When we start with amber, we make two, we explore two decisions. When you then, uh, here at MBER, you make, you explore two decisions. When you're here, 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 you explore two decisions. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's very difficult to capture in a loop. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, I guess you could try to do it by you know, looping over two to the n and looking at binary numbers or some crazy thing like that. But it's not worth it. So I purposefully chose a problem where you have no realistic choice but to use recursion. So if anyone tries to do this with a loop, unless you're doing it you know as an extra credit super challenge if, if you're trying to do it because the loop because you don't you want to avoid recursion because you find recursion distasteful you're not going to get it this this problem was definitely selected because the recursive solution is the only reasonable one there is an unreasonable non-recursive solution but it is so complex that you will not get at it uh, uh, you know some of you will prove me wrong but um yeah I'm sorry? I, yeah, that's, that's a good question. And that's kind of um, an implementation detail. So here, you know, because I just wrote the pseudocode and I wrote it in a hurry, I didn't try to factor those out. If I look at the pseudocode and now I want to implement it, I say, you know, gosh, it looks like the rest and the rest occurs twice, so I'm going to store it in a variable. So using the four strings, the what? Using four strings, is that Oh, I mean that that really is an implementation detail. Oh, different people will come up with different decisions on that one. And um, so I guess the difference between 46A and 46B is that in 46A the focus is on you know, these very minute technical questions, like what you were just asking, you know, should I use four st strings or two strings or whatever? But in 46B, we're gonna say, okay, you, know, you guys have gone through that, you can make those decisions, and mostly we'll trust you to make reasonable ones. And, but the real question is, what is the algorithm? What's the method? What is the way that one can structure this computation? So that's what I care about. So you should really 
you know, understand why you want to use recursion or in which order. The, and you, you need to understand there's two different costs involved here. There's the step cost versus the recursive cost. They're different. That's an important question. And I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over do I use two strings or four. Um, typically, what a competent programmer will do is when you're at this stage in Eclipse. Can I, have, can I hear myself, please? When you're at this stage in Eclipse, what I usually do is I say, you know, what, what can I do to make this a little better? And I will often make a small cosmetic change, like introduce an extra variable that makes it clearer. Or in this case, I might say, you know, this S here, that is really ugly. Why S? And I might change it to tokens or something. Uh, where's rename? Yeah. And so how do I know when to make these cosmetic changes? Because as I wrote the method, I looked at my pseudocode, I wrote the method, and I know in my gut where I made some shortcut that I was slightly embarrassed about. And then when I'm all done, I try to remember those moments and I can come back to fix those so that looks nice and clean. But it's not, you know, you're in a hurry maybe and that's, that would not be my first concern. The first concern really is can you structure this computation? Can you with whatever many strings or lists or whatever, can you get a structure that, that is a fair representation of the problem? And so this, the structure here is key. You need to understand here is how you compute the cost. Oh, what's missing from here? You know, I'm, so I'm saying I'm done with the pseudocode, but I'm actually not. What's missing? The base case, yes. So figure out the base case and add it to them. Any more questions on this one, or was this a valuable hint? OK, at this point, I've done almost all the work for you. I've gotten it to the level where you have pseudocode. Yes? Um, so for the final, all we have to do is basically check to see which letter is should be group. Like, depending on what letter Yeah, kind of. I mean, for the final, you, um, the, 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 diff the unsatisfactory part of the draft is you say, what is the cost of Mississippi? And it tells you 341, right? And it doesn't tell you how to decompose it to get to that minimum cost. Yes, and so for the final, you need to figure out how to do that. So I will be glad to entertain questions about that on Wednesday. Um, so you know, feel free to think about it before that. But I want people to get the basic thing in their brains before getting to that second level of complexity. Okay, so I'm going to explain it with this picture, right? So, so if you look at amber, um, the the cost of breaking a and amber is zero dollars. That's what I, that's what step cost returns. And then I have to still break up amber. It's gonna it's not free. It's gonna cost something, but I have a perfectly good method that can tell me how to do it, namely that recursive method cost. So that's the recursive call. Other questions? Okay, someone had a question about 5A or something? I can't remember. One of you came to me and said, you're going to put it on Piazza. Well, let's see what Piazza tells me. Okay, let's, that wasn't it. Now these are all 5B. All right, so um, we'll get to the final question later. Um, 
about the exam, there will be a makeup exam, a, a practice exam um, as part of next Monday's session. So next Monday, you all bring your laptops. I will give you an exam that kind of looks like a, a half of a regular exam, and we'll do it in class. So you'll get to experience it, and you get a feeling for what the timing is and what the complexity is. And so there'll be some programming, some pseudocode, some uh, showing that you understood some of the stuff in the lab. And that's that, yeah. People ask me, will there be multiple choice questions? No. No. Right? Uh, so um, <coughs> no one's going to hire you because you can answer multiple choice questions. Um, so I'll give the exam. Um, what should you study for it? I will give you a, a when, uh, once you're done with this homework, I'll give you a list of things that would be profitable to study for the exam. But in a nutshell, the single most important thing that you can study for the exam is to review my solutions for the homework assignments. I will promise that every exam question will have something to do with one of the old homework assignments. That, that's context that you're familiar with. That way, you know, people say, will it be as vague and, uh, and confusing on the exam as on the homework assignments? And so that way, at least it'll be the same vagueness and confusion that you're already familiar with. Um, so it'll be similar to those. And if you, um, so you're allowed to bring the code of my solutions to the exam. You're allowed to study, copy, and modify it during the exam. Um, that would of course mean that if you understood that code you would be at a tremendous advantage. It will be necessary for you to get the virtual machine to be in working order for the exam. Anyone who does not yet have that needs to bring the computer to the lab assistant or to me if you don't have that. There will be a one activity that will force you to take a screenshot of something inside the virtual machine and you would lose points if you can't do that. All right, now if I could please have my 15 minutes for my actual lecture. Yes, so everything that, um, that will have to do with like the virtual machine will have been covered in the lab. And so if you have succeeded in doing it with the lab, then you, know, then you should be able to. There's nothing really tricky, but uh, you know, you're on your own. Yeah. All right, so um, quickly going through you know, what's, what's in these uh, sections three and four. Um, so there is this thing that, you know, when, that when you implement this Fibonacci numbers in, um, I hope that everyone has seen these, these funny numbers, right? So you, have one plus one is two, and then you shift over, one plus two is three, two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, five plus eight is 11, and so on. And so these numbers uh, you know, are somewhat interesting or not. Um, they've been studied a lot. And so there's a simple recursive solution for them that you've seen in the book. And you can program it just like that. And when you program it like that, and you need to try this at home because otherwise you don't believe it. I run this program that, that computes the Fibonacci numbers and compute like F40 or something. You know, the 40th Fibonacci number. And it's unbelievable how slow it is. You compute like F30 and it kind of comes in reasonably fast, 31, 32, and it gets really slow. And it's not clear why that should be so because just with a calculator, you can compute F40 in no time at all. Um, but the, the problem is this inefficient recursion pattern. So in the case of Fibonacci, one does a lot of double computations. And um, so there is a very small lesson here, really, and that is that sometimes, not very often, sometimes a recursion that's poorly set up when you keep calling the same thing over and over is inefficient, and then you're actually better off with a loop. Um, does it ever happen in practice? Almost never. In almost all cases, you should just do the recursion if it's easier to understand, do, or do the loop if that's easier to understand, but don't worry too much about efficiency. Why is it in the book? Because the people who make adoption decisions care deeply about this stuff. 
Um, so we're not going to say too, too much about this. Um, so the book then goes on and say, you know, with that is palindrome method. Of course, you could have written it as a loop. Because the is palindrome method, if you remember what it does, is it has a string. It chops off the first, it chops off the last one. Then it checks whether the middle is an is palindrome. Well, you could have also just kept on chopping and comparing and chopping and comparing. And the loop would have done the same thing. Fine, that's the way it is. In this case, the loop and the, uh, the recursion are the same. Will I put a multiple choice question on the exam that says, is recursion always slower? Is recursion always faster? No, right? There's nothing to be gained from that. So you should always choose recursion if it makes the problem easier to understand. You should use loops if they make the problem easier to understand. In almost all cases, the, the implementation impact is minimal. So <coughs> the reason this permutation section is in the, uh, is in the book is that that's kind of the first algorithm that is obviously useful, that is difficult to do without recursion. All the stuff that came before, factorial, Fibonacci, finding palindromes, finding the first match, all of that stuff you can do with loops. You know, the triangle numbers, you don't even need a loop. Um, but the first question that's kind of difficult enough that you say that that uh, it's not clear how to do this at all with the loop is this, uh, is this thing. Why do we care about uh, these, these permutations? Well, it really often happens that you want to write some program where you need to try things out in different orders. And you really might have to try it out in all possible orders. Or you might want to have some random sampling of all possible orders. So being able to say, here's all the various ways that you can rearrange something is, is often useful in applications. And the recursive solution for permutations is pretty easy. So we have the string eat, and it has six permutations. So how come there's only five here? Okay, which one is missing? There's one missing here, right? There's A, T, E. So you can see there's two that start with E, there's two that start with A, and there's two that start with T. And that is the key to the recursive uh, computation, right? You have a string. It has some number of letters. You take off the first letter and permute the rest. Then you take off the second letter and permute the rest. You take off the third letter and permute the rest, and so on. So if you let the string has n letters, you do this thing n times. So for each of the letters, let's actually write down the pseudocode since we're in pseudocode mode. For each letter L and S, compute the permutations of S without L, stick L in front. So that's how you compute the permutations. And it's recursive because over here, we're having the recursive. So now try to do this in your mind without recursion. So let's take a longish enough string, like you want to have a string where all the letters are different, otherwise it's more complicated. So we can't use permutation um, method. 
How many permutations are there of this string? Six. No. How many permutations are of the string method? Seven hundred and twenty. Why? No, 120, right? 120, yes, 120. Because, so we can start with M, E, T, H, O, or D. And then here we're looking at the permutations of acid of the ones of T, H, O, D, and so on. So there's six levels of decision here. And then there'll be five levels of decision for each of those which recursively give you four levels of decision on the next letter, and so on. So six times five times four times three times two is 120. So if you wanted to do this with a loop, again, the challenge would be how do you do, you know, you had a six-fold branch here. Then over here, you're going to have a five-fold branch here for each of the five letters, another five-fold branch, for each of those, you have a four-fold branch. And that would be very difficult to schedule with a loop. So in this case, recursion is hard to avoid. It's possible to avoid it, but it's no fun. OK, so here it goes through all of this in, in gory detail. We're not going to do this. <coughs> but here is a super useful exercise that uh, for recursion practice that, that I highly recommend. And that is that and, um, look, read up in the book about permutations. And now let's see whether we can apply the same knowledge to something similar, to a similar problem. So now I don't want to look at permutations. But I want to look at subsequences. So for some reason, I've chosen the example of the word brat. And so a subsequence is some sequence of letters that appears in the same order. Like bat would be a subsequence because the B-A-T appear in the same order as they are in brat. So we don't have the time to do the clicker question stuff right now. How many subsequences are there of brat? Um, you can count through those, and there are 16. So if the string has length n, like you know, Mississippi or something, how many subsequences are there? What do you think? It is 2 to the n. So as it turns out, um, and the reason for that is that that's as many subsets there are. If you have n elements, you have 2 to the n subsets. If 2 to the n weighs each time, you say, do I pick it, don't I pick it? Do I pick it, don't I pick it? So yeah, let's actually do, do this one, and then we'll call it a day. So let's fire up Piazza here. So we're just going to focus on this clicker question here.
So we want to find all the subsequences of turn. And we want to put recursion to good use. So we say, let's say that by good fortune, we already know all of the subsequences of earn. You know, that they have like subsequence like U and Un and Earn and whatever, a whole bunch of them. And that's how recursion works, right? You say, by good fortune, we know all the solutions for smaller problems. We just have to ask for them and they give them to us by someone else. So how do we put together all the subsequences of turn if we know those of Earn? And so your choices are, you always, for each of them, there's eight of them, you put T in front. Or for each of them, you put T everywhere you can. Like you have un and you would put ton and utten and unt. Or for each of them, you either put the T or you don't. So you would do ton or un. Or maybe none of these are going to work to get all of the subsequences. And you also need to look at other subsequences of other strings. It could be. So that is what you should decide in the next 30 seconds, please. I have 82 votes, and if I could please have a few more. No one gets to leave the room until I have at least 100. Okay, now we have 100. Um, and all right. So. That there's no majority win winner, that's not good because the answer should be easy. The correct answer is three. And the, yeah, um, and the reason it can't be two is if you look at a subsequence of earn like un, and if you put a t here, that's a subsequence, all right, but utn is not a subsequence because they don't appear in the, se in the right order. And so putting it and unt the same thing. So this one, it can't be. And so there were a whole bunch of people who said that's no good, but it actually is good. And so if anyone wants recursion practice, you go on to do five and six and code it up. It's great practice. All right, I'll see you Wednesday with lots of homework questions.